I mean, it feels ironic because it doesn't feel like we've ranted or raved enough. I mean, we've just destroyed Christmas, <laughs> put in a new terrorist holiday to blow up Parliament, just as our own Parliament is sinking. We've said that Britishness should never be a thing anymore, nor should Americans. Flags are dead. <laughs> I mean, we've but we're also barely started talking about any actual marketing or advertising. I sort of feel like we've ranted or raved enough. I'm not sh- I'm I think, not sure where else I can go. I think I think that's the <laughs> teaser for the episode right there. That's perfect. <laughs> Welcome to Punchy by Rival, where we take the gloves off to share the hard-hitting realities of the challenger marketing world. Each week, we'll break down the buzz and cut through the BS, the top stories and trends to tell you what you really need to know and do differently to grow your brand and career. We are live, and I am back home in London, so hopefully this means my Wi-Fi will hold up this time. Apologies for that last week and i'm actually traveling the next three weeks so we're gonna see how that goes but we have a fantastic show today a fantastic guest in mr james kirkham who i have to say is one of the people one of the first people that i met when i moved over to london and has always been close friend and has really helped me kind of um i guess get my feet originally in the scene over here so james appreciate you coming on the show oh i think you're on mute there you go. There we go. They're starting well. Um, <laughs> my technical skills showing their normal prowess. Thank you for having me, was what I was trying to say. And it's a real pleasure to be here. Amazing. All right. So probably most of you listening will have heard of James Kirkham. But to give you a quick overview, James has an incredible career, starting with co-founding digital agency Holler at age 23. It was the first agency in the world to market a TV show using social media. And it was a trailblazing business that was eventually bought by the Publicis Group in 2010. After that, James, as he's told me, went to work on his passion. So he was at Copa 90 for a bit. He was at Defected Records. He is now the founder of Iconic. So, um, so much good stuff to talk about. I'm really excited to have you on the show, James. And then, of course, I have Jenna and DuBose. So Jenna, co-founder, managing partner, and rival, and a woman who, after our retreat to Turkey, no longer takes management meetings unless they're in a swimming pool. And DuBose, co-founder, managing partner who speaks seven languages, but only up to level two on Duolingo. All right, let's get into the show today and stick with us to the end, whether you're watching live or listening after the fact, because we have a very special guest who's going to be joining us for the last two minutes. All right, without further ado, story number one from James. And this is very timely, given what has just happened here in the UK. A story from the drum on leveraging brand Britain in a post-COVID world. So in this article, the author discusses the challenges of globalization when it comes to taking British brands out to the four corners of the world. He describes the biggest challenge one faces when taking brand Britain outside the country is to decide which Britain you want to represent. Who's Britain, what Britain, and what is British? The author argues that Britain is genuinely great. It's in the name after all. And if you can take the right bits of it and apply them credibly to your brand, then you're on to a winner. So James, as the only native-born Brit, even though DuBose does have citizenship, let's tee, tee you up. You have one minute on the clock to talk about this article. I've got nothing against this author or indeed the drama of a fantastic publication need to add. But I guess my thoughts is that I just don't believe this is the right question right now. So this isn't about which side of Britain we should really be focused on, whether it be the pageantry and the royalty that we've seen so much of recently or, you know, our young up and coming grime artists. It's not about that. We've got the most seismic stuff going on that's going to be the biggest thing since the pandemic and maybe even more start the cost of living crisis without being too morose and morbid but it's true the energy fuel bills the spiraling mortgage problems people will not have money in their pocket so if we are marketing and we are working amongst brands nothing will look the same whether it be staying in rather than going out whether it be deciding not to go to the pub or the pubs closed down in the first place they're the kind of problems and pillars that i think people actually need to lean into and we can lean into them i'm a big believer in creativity from adversity i think incredible stuff comes out of the times you perhaps need it the most whole eras of music started if you look at the punk movement that came out of the 70s or rave culture that came out of thatcher's britain in the 80s good stuff comes from it 
but we need to kind of embrace it and lean in and fuel these communities of creative talent, the makers and doers that are probably amongst the young who can actually serve Britain best. So it's not really a question of should we be flying a Union Jack or should we be supporting this kind of two bit sort of chancer who might exist at one end of a royal family or dare I even begin to talk about the politics, which is so far gone. Everyone's too disenfranchised from the whole thing. Brand Britain is something very different. We need to seize the chance of the creativity that exists here, which has always been good, and whether let it flourish in music or in sports or in fashion or in style and really kick on there because that's what Britain should be about. I just think those questions about what Brand Britain is need to be reflective of the world that we're in right now. Love the passion and the complete disregard for the timer. Also, I did not know that uh, Margaret Margaret Thatcher was behind the rave movement in the eighties. There you go, you learn something new every day. I'm so but is this is this about is this about how Britain is marketing itself to the world, or is it more about, or potentially it's both, how British brands need to incorporate modern British culture and, I guess, historical British culture into how they grow internationally? I think for so many brands, if if a brand is perhaps using uh, Britishness as part of their core, even even as a, a gentle parallel. If you look at a cup of tea, something quintessentially British, you know, for many years now, great tea brands at the heart of their strategy, which I'm sure the Bose will be able to articulate far better than me, it's about bringing a person back to themselves. It's not really the Britishness. It just happens to be a, heart of, a part of British culture, like many other food and drinks. I guess the point is, though, is that brands can't be blinkered. There is a reality check right now. And there's also opportunity around that. There's great opportunity. It shouldn't be a, just a sheer sense of foreboding and we should hunker down and I'll see you in three years. But I think they need to lean into the reality in order to connect better. Otherwise, they look blinkered or they will probably risk alienating consumers or look entirely out of touch. Who wants to jump in? Dubose is the honorary, I guess, technical but in this, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm legally British. British. I was born in Alabama. <laughs> allegedly, <laughs> alleged, British. allegedly. No, 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 actually, I actually and everything. I he's, he's saying, "God save the queen, queen." It's, it's a king now, by the way. It is a king yeah, now, but it was a queen. Yeah. So that's pretty British. That's pretty. I'm British. really British. <laughs> it is. And, yeah. and to that point, like I, I completely agree with what James has said. I think his his initial monologue was actually four times longer than the tenure of our last prime minister, <laughs> as of about an hour ago. <laughs> Uh, but generally, I, I think, you know, the, the thing about Britain that strikes me, and this is something that, that hit me when I first moved over here, is, that, you know, there is the wider debate about what is brand Britain, right? Is it Michael Caine and Only Fools and Horses? Is it Margaret Thatcher dropping the beat at a rave movement while stifling the miners? Is it kind of all the way through to, to, to Grime and, how, and Glastonbury? And I think it's all of those things, right, for different people at different times. But I think the, the interesting thing here is conversation, I think, to James's point, is not about marketing for Britain right now. It's about product. What is the thing we're actually selling? What is the internal organization of the structure? And then you build the brand around it. Because I think at the moment you look at Britain and I think there is a, a wider question on how are we going to get the, the internal marketing aligned so that everyone knows kind of generally what's the thing we're proud of and what we stand for? And then I think you push forward. Otherwise, I think to that point, you know, there are amazingly nostalgic anchor points that we can always touch on. A Kappa, the Queen, uh, Downton Abbey. But that's like a brand going back to something that was popular 15, 20 years ago and trying to trot out the greatest hits. There has to be a certain point to go you know, internally and as a country. What are we, we proud of? Where are we going to come out of this, this kind of crisis we're facing and, and what we create? And then that becomes the thing that I think the modern British brand is built around, because at the moment it's at a bit of a crossroads. Jenna, anything to add? I'm going to try and get over my leftist philosophy anti-capital like the reduction of questions of national identity and political lives and spheres into uh, term capital terms like market marketing and product um i'm gonna move past that for a minute but i just had to bring attention to it but i, I don't know i i definitely agree like i say with like with, with james and dubose on this one i guess you know i'm i'm moving i feel really great about my move back to the uk it's happening in a couple months it feels like a really good time to move back to britain woo for me um but i guess like from the American 
American perspective, we we kind of have the equivalent of this, like where it's like, yeah, like there's like kind of like, you know, uh, yeah, the same kind of nostalgia for like the American flag or again, you know, what is like marketing like for brand like USA. So I guess from my perspective, it kind of mirrors a lot of what's going on in the UK. It's like, I actually kind of wish like more brands would lean into like actually, you know what, like it is not just, you know, the realm of people that want to whitewash or like gloss over some of the really shitty things about like our respective like countries, histories and cultures in the past and actually be like you know what brand britain does in fact stand for like the labor movements of the past or like rave movements and culture and that actually to sort of be engaged in the current like t- like tumultuous situation that we have like to make a better britain is or in our case you know a better a better america that those things are also part of like the brand or like national identity advertisers are part of like the national discourse on these things and so i think that again like more movement of like you know being british is not just as simple as like a cup of tea but it is also like the incredible historical like i say like labor movements and push for for you know better societies and cultures that the uk has been a leader on historically i think that it's those types of things too am i allowed to reply eric or are we go for it short for time tiny a tiny quick reply i love that and i love your point on the flags and i know this isn't just a british point and i know this is probably nationalist points all over but whether it be the American flag or the British flag or another, there is this, that's almost like a shorthand, isn't it? Like an excuse to suppose, well, we'll wave that, we'll show that, we'll stick the Union Jack on a bunch of stuff and we've pretty much got it. But whereas the irony, I think, is that it does encapsulate so much, whether it be the references of Michael Caine or those minis or the 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 royalty or the Prince Des- Di and Charles's, whatever it is, there is a history in that background. But as David Bowie, when he always talks about creating rather than curating that's why i feel there's such a job to do such onus on anyone who's even beginning to touch the fringes of creative communities to do just that to encourage people to make and do and create now and have something that that flag can even represent if we were holding it up again in 20 years because otherwise it's just a shorthand for something that no longer exists which Hmm. is the worry i think it's it's such a good point where you go i think leveraging is what it is It's, it's reinforcing and redefining uh, the brand of Britain. And I think it's intriguing because you, you go, you know, most of the modern references of Britain are, are quite contradictory. It's a country that holds last night of the proms, but also Bodie McBoatface in the same kind of five years. It's it, it's the idea of Downton Abbey, but also eating is cheating. And I think there has to be something that starts to go like, what are the new things that are exciting that sit behind the symbols that, that people recognize and that we hold dear? And I think for all of Jenna's uh, lack of comfort around the idea that countries are the original market marketing brands, really, there is that idea that at a certain point, you, you've got to put meaning behind those symbols and those distinctive assets, if you will. Capitalist Our, pig. <laughs> on that note, <laughs> I okay, am God. going to move us on. So James, eight points to you, but I have to dock you two points for going so far over on the timer. So that's six points. Dubose, six points Fair for enough. you, because I wasn't fully paying attention because I realized I needed to adjust the script for our guests later, but I assume it was something very smart because it usually is. And Jenna, six points for you just to make it a tie going into round two. And our second story from Jenna is from Krebs on security. So it's kind of like a press release type thing, right? Glut of fake LinkedIn profile pits HR against the bots. Lately, there's been a swarm of phony executive profiles on LinkedIn, creating a bit of an identity crisis for the business networking site and for companies that rely on it. To be honest, I think most of the article is in the headline, but Jenna, I will let you expand and give your point of view. First, I have to say, Krebs and Security, this is not like a press release. Krebs and Security is actually okay. a fairly in-depth subject matter expertise blog on cybersecurity, like on the internet. If you guys are interested in those things, you should check it out. It's really cool. You know, I read I read all of the other cybersecurity blogs, but somehow not this one. Well, this is the biggest one, so your preparation is lacking. Yeah. Um, no, I mostly this one, like I said, was interesting uh, primarily for me uh, just around like, you know, it, it, it went into some fairly significant detail on the depth now of the problem that LinkedIn is starting to face on bots, where I think that there's been a perception, at least commonly before that LinkedIn has not had as much of a bot problem. Um, the rest of the article, again, goes into some of, some of the specifics about like how these profiles seem to be created, that many of them have been kind of AI generated, but are listing themselves as executives executives at fairly at specifically cybersecurity executives at like S&P or Fortune you know 500 or 1000 brands and it really like the steps that LinkedIn is or in some cases is not taking to deal with those um mostly again like just kind of one of those things where it's like hey you know uh an, an interesting extension of the trend yeah. obviously kind of like <clears throat> the bot amplification of content around elections like historically and other platforms has been a thing but it's now on LinkedIn uh and what do we do about that and how do we feel about it 
Yeah. It, it It is interesting because, yeah, it hasn't really had the bot problem that a lot of the other social networks have had. I mean, there's so much spam, which is just kind of like, you know, a lot of these sales people that automate the outreach. I would love if they could find a way to do something about that. But it hasn't really, you know, the actual bot problem hasn't really been a thing for them. But I think as they shift towards being more of a content platform, then that's likely where a lot of these problems are going to come up as they have with other social platforms. James, what do you think about this? Um, you've taught me something new, Jennifer, for starters. I did not realize about it and that I'm less aware of the cybersecurity blogs, blogosphere as Eric. So, you know, excuse my ignorance. <laughs> um, uh, for starters, well done on them on creating bots that are so sophisticated that you're creating entire profiles and effectively masquerading as, you know, vaguely intelligent people in the ad industry or whatever. Uh, you know, there's a part of me that almost admires that. And I guess what I mean by that is there's something so clear and obvious seemingly on the world of Twitter bots, right? And we've all seen about a billion of them. I mean, Elon Musk, bless him, desperately tried to get out of an entire deal on the basis supposedly of those pesky bots. Um, but that's not come unstuck. LinkedIn's prowess, I mean, you know, this very show right now is probably being watched by most people on that platform, has been pretty acute in terms of its trajectory. It's been super, super impressive. So I guess, as Eric implied, it's not surprising the bots are now starting to take over the asylum. The concern will be LinkedIn is so much more than a job job sphere now. You know, the amount of political stuff, for example, you see on there and people trying to influence. So the bots getting in bunks, that will be an issue and needs to be addressed. Well, that was like one of the things, like I said, that they cool. talk about is that, sorry, I was just to say like um, yeah. that actually like a huge, a huge usage of these bot networks has been in like recruitment scams in order to farm personal information from people. Um, like I said, which is kind of one of those things where it's like, oh, like, again, with that kind of veneer of credibility that comes with like LinkedIn is that the people are you know, so much more trusting and willing to do that, that there's just these additional vectors of, you know, fraud. I mean, I, I think to that point, it's, it's quite an interesting one because you kind of have to, to start with congratulations, LinkedIn, you're a real boy now on the <laughs> idea that when all the, the bots kind of show up, you've done a good job, right? Like we all know for years, LinkedIn's whole thing was like, we're more than just when you're looking for a job, please come and share inane stories of how you've given money to the homeless. And this is how you can learn five lessons for marketing about it. And I think, you know, that that's been the challenge and that I think they have now gotten people to show up and do genuinely useful thought leadership in some cases and a lot of genuinely not useful status updates other times with on the platform. And I think, you know, it's an interesting thing to gauge attention, not just from the numbers, but when people start seeing an opportunity there. And I think when you start seeing bot creators going into the platform and starting to, to leverage that, that's where I think, you know, you started to turn a corner within LinkedIn. I think it's interesting. And it has a power. Mm, Sorry. Exactly. It's it power attracts kind of opportunity and opportunity is going to attract bot makers. So I think it's no different than what you're seeing on other platforms like Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, et cetera, who've had to start kind of this battle of chasing them out and watching to see how kind of bots adapt. But it's a it's a great sign for LinkedIn, even if it does mean that, uh, you know, we're all going to start getting random invites from John C. Definitely CEO uh, to tell us about an incredible offer. <laughs> Six points to Dubose, mostly for quoting Pinocchio. Seven points to Jenna, because I think it's a great article and a great point and something that we should all be aware of. James, I'm going to give you five points just to make it interesting. So going into the final round, we got James with 11, Jenna with 13, and Dubose with 12. It is neck and neck, everybody. This is, <laughs> this is intense. Um, I forget who's been winning, so I, I don't know who to actually give this to. Not that the points are rigged or anything like that. Okay, story three. For Dubose, very, once again, the first UK realty retailer to launch a Christmas campaign. Man, is it Christmas already? With more than 70 days until Christmas, very, along with creative agency Grey London. I mean, you can just see all the agencies jockeying for this back in like March is the first UK brand to release its festive campaign. Dubose, what say you? When is a Christmas ad not a Christmas ad? When is it just when the it's idea? it's not Christmas. It, it, when you put a Santa hat on something, is that make it a Christmas ad if it's released in June? I mean, I, I think there's a few things here that strike me. I think first off, as James alluded to earlier, economic conditions in the UK have meant that retailers are really salivating for the opportunity of starting to launch their sales and promotions because they want to be the first to cut through on kind of alleviating some of the concerns and the economic kind of worries they're going to come with the Christmas shopping season. So that's understandable. 
And I think, you know, that found an amazing partner, as you alluded to, Eric, in the idea that most Christmas ads are actually shot in June or July. If you ever chat to anybody at an agency that has to do large TV ads, they start planning them in February or March a lot of the time. They shoot them in June, July or August, and then they have to sit on them kind of, you know, as they burn a hole in their proverbial pockets until they can release them. And I think, you know, normally it was about second week of November is when you get most of them launched in the UK. Very started edging that forward. But I think there's an interesting thing here in the idea that, yes, you can be the first mover. Yes, you can go early on and start talking about Christmas, but the consumer is going to have to follow you there. And and I think breaking the kind of unspoken Halloween barrier on this is just getting a bit confusing because at a certain point, it can't go before Labor Day, can it? So I think, you know, what we're seeing here is a Christmas ad in name only, but probably about three weeks too early. Jenna? I literally couldn't even read the article for this because when I went to go click on it, they're a huge interstitial ad. Actually, it's not huge. It's an incorrectly sized mobile ad from Nielsen Digital Ad Ratings. Whoever's running their ads, you put the wrong sizing up for this. But it's for it's for Halloween. It's for will your ads spook the right people this October? So the ad that I got served ahead of this one was for Halloween. So I didn't oh actually God. read the article. My bad, I guess. I just thought that was too funny to ruin. Uh, and also, I was really irritated to be served an incorrectly sized ad. Um uh, this is I guess, like one of the nice things I feel like about the United States is that like Thanksgiving serves as like a natural like guaranteed like buffer. Maybe the UK you guys should get some. Other, it does. I feel like yeah because it's like we've got like Halloween like like the Halloween thing and then there's the month of Thanksgiving stuff and then after Thanksgiving is when Christmas starts. The UK should look at getting some sort of november holiday as a buffer for this i mean i've been lobbying to have thanksgiving in the uk for a while so if people want to get on board with that let me know Um, but but it's also like but christmas in the u.s is not christmas in the uk you know culturally and also when it comes to advertising like the closest equivalent i've always said is more the super bowl so Mm -hmm. i think you are seeing similarly that super bowl ads are released earlier and earlier online i don't know exactly when but it's certainly like well before the game so i could see the same thing happening over there but i think that that's the closest equivalent when it comes to advertising is like super bowl ads are the equivalent of christmas ads in the uk but i think there is a point here a you've forgotten about guy fox night that should have technically been the barrier of christmas ads yeah as a, a weird orphaned holiday that involves mostly mask and bonfires and then yeah. exactly is like to the point of the Super Bowl analogy. This is the equivalent of launching a Super Bowl ad before the playoffs right. start. It's so right. yeah, you... which will probably happen. There's a perfect irony of you suggesting that we should really revitalize Guy Fawkes Night because they're ultimately celebrating the, the the potential terrorist plot on the Houses of Parliament. Religious, <laughs> which, religious which brings... anti-government extremists. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and That's you know what? Again, I think happen. if you put that out. Put it out there now and say we really need that Halloween buffer, as you described earlier, which, again, I'll be honest, I hadn't heard that terminology before, but I feel like I've really missed out. I mean, my gosh, I hate the fact that Christmas ads are out. I just think at what point do you draw the line? And you know what? Maybe we're not we're not grabbing hold of Halloween quite you do it like you do in the States. We haven't got the holidays, Thanksgiving peace. We clearly need to resurrect the Guy Fawkes gunfowder plot at all costs. There was an interesting bit a few years ago. I do like, I'm going to take this vaguely serious for the last 10 seconds. Eric's analogy to Super Bowl is true. So uh, we we got into Pop Idol and X Factor and the ad on that first slot, on that first show, that first weekend was the spot that you would always try and get. And it was appointment to view advertising. I feel fortunately it is jumping the shark. I'm hoping this saturated coverage will lead us to a state where we just stop advertising at this full stop. I mean, there's got to be a point where you go, this just loses the effectiveness of trying to hop in front of someone else. And then you just don't have cultural relevance. Like, I think it's a funny one because this is media planning going, hey, we can go first. And then no one kicking in and going, well, if no one cares, it's Christmas. Is it a good Christmas ad? I mean, if Vary had gone with a a Guy Fox Night themed ad instead, that would have a lot more relevance and cut through. This but, has okay. brand planner written. No, let's not throw media planners <laughs> under the bus here, Dubos. This has like you can own. We've this done that enough on this moment. show. Yeah, let's not. This, let's be this kind is of this is a big boss. World. You can throw the brand and the media planner under the bus. <laughs> this right, we fair. run over everybody, but I think I've always thought about that. I mean, like these moments for advertisers are entirely created, right? And you think about some of the holidays, like Singles Day in China and all that and Black Friday and what it's become like these are created by businesses Mm -hmm. for commercial purpose so I've always thought 
it, and I'm sure somebody has tried to do it, but hasn't been successful. Like, why is there not kind of like a big game type moment in the UK, like a different tent pole advertising event? Champions League final. I guess so, but That's... still not the same as the Super Bowl. The, the biggest it... difference with the Super Bowl is like viewership. Yeah, 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 all that stuff. But it is a moment in time like Christmas in the UK where people proactively choose to watch and are excited about ads. And it's the only time people will watch ads if it's good it. content otherwise, but people actually want to watch advertising. It's the only time of the year that that occurs. And that's why Christmas in the UK is the closest similarity for me, but there's nothing like that around sports for the, the sport, right? the sport and the channel were perfectly befitting. So just like in the fifties yep. with long drawn, drawn out games of cricket in the UK or baseball that fitted or befitted radio, like beautiful, long sprawling commentary talking about birds at the end of a pitch that no one's really listening to the eighties and NFL and gridiron and television and the compartmentalized nature of it was bang. Our adverts work here. You know, this era is not perhaps, I don't believe, perfectly built in the same way. In fact, there's lots of you know, conversation was football, soccer, was it more befitting where that kind of clip culture ability to kind of get spread those moments of a Champions League final and Ronaldo scoring ahead of spreading around the world in the way that we know and being memefied is far more built for this era, I think. All right. Um, I really wanted James to win because I was curious what his rant or rave would be. However, producer Hannah left a note in the brief saying that Jenna has not won since she's been here. So Jenna. No, I, I, I won. I won in that's what Turkey. I, thought. I won in You Turkey. won in Turkey, right? I did. Okay, James, yeah. you're the winner. James, all the points to yeah. you. Two minutes Thank rant so or rave. Am I ranting what and raving got? now? Is this where I, is this where I didn't read is this where I didn't read the rules? Let it let it loose. <laughs> but am I on a different subject? Oh my gosh, I didn't read the rules properly. Is this now a different subject? I thought I was only doing one subject. Oh no, you can do it about anything. Like it could be something we've oh, already yes. chatted about, it could be something new, just you know, whatever you fancy. <laughs> but I mean, it feels ironic. It doesn't feel like we, we've ranted or raved enough. I mean, we've just destroyed Christmas, <laughs> put in a new terrorist holiday to blow up Parliament, just as our own Parliament is sinking. We've said that Britishness should never be a thing anymore, nor should Americans. Flags are dead. <laughs> I mean, we've but we're also barely started talking about any actual marketing or advertising. I sort of feel like we've ranted or raved enough. I'm not sure. I'm I not think, sure where else I can go. I think. I think that's the <laughs> teaser for the episode right there. That's perfect. Um, if you have something you are very passionate about, either positively or negatively, then it would be great to hear it. Otherwise, we can go to we can go to Jenna. Oh, the, the you know the you made me Eric. The positive stuff I'm talking about at the moment is probably the place I'm playing work wise at the moment, which is the yeah maybe segues out of what you were just talking about with NFL is the beautiful way culture currently collides and anyone who works in sports and who works in sports apparel, you know, work that I know you guys have done recently, anyone who works in music, in fashion, all of those worlds interconnect, interconnect are interwoven, are entirely entwined. They mutually fool one another. And it's unbelievably chaotic and incredibly creative and exciting right now. You can't have a taller myopic perspective working just in football and not think about the music and think about the culturally symbolic talent and think about the fashions and thinking about the world of gaming, for example. And wherever you sit on that Venn diagram, it's a beautiful kind of uh, elegant chaos, as I often call it. So, yeah, you know I bang on about that a lot, though. <laughs> elegant chaos would be a great name for an agency. So maybe after after <laughs> Iconic. <laughs> my rave would have been or my rant would have been about how Google is deprecating keyword targeting on YouTube. So that was like way cooler than mine. <laughs> or Google is deprecating keyword targeting on YouTube, but I think they can fuck off for it. I think it's a bunch of bullshit. There we go. Wow. Isn't that what your article is about <laughs> next week? No, that the, the article next week is just generally Google is not your friend. One of the supporting <laughs> the supporting arguments for why Google is I not knew your it friend was is something. Google is deprecating yeah. keyword targeting on YouTube. Yeah. Google Google is under the rival bus with the brand planners and the media buyers. So Thumbs down. Thumbs we're going to need a bigger bus. All right, before we go, enemies Google. <laughs> <laughs> watch out. Before we go, we have a very special guest oh, who is going to stop by and join us. And her name is Kenna Jummings. Kenna <laughs> is a marketing industry reporter. And she is going to tell us about London's hottest new agency. And if she's able to do so, she has never seen the words that she is about to read. If she is able to do so, she will get a million points 
Kenna, over to you. London's hottest agency is Spicy Turtle. They have everything. Strategic strategists strategically strategizing your strategy. They live their lives according to a consumer journey slide. A best-in-class absence of customer-built fit-for-purpose constantly evolving buzzwords. Creatives who worked on British Airways in the 90s but don't tell you about it. <laughs> TikTok creators who ride around on two miniature Icelandic horses named Sigmund and Olaf. Is it a filter? Are they real? Programmatic ads that buy themselves based on the price of Dogecoin. And machine learning based on artificial intelligence, based on natural language processing, based on infinite semantic web defibrillation data sets. New York's hottest club. Oh, wait. London's hottest <laughs> agency is Spicy Turtle. All right. Finn. Well done. You don't get the you don't get the million points because you did break in the middle there, but that was, it pretty was good. the horses. For it was the mini first... mini Icelandic horses. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, we're a real we're a real company this is a real professional <laughs> podcast everybody Business. google better you guys watch earn, out you guys earn money the, you got clients right <laughs> you get paid in dreams <laughs> no this, this so is what we do all day there's just not usually a mic and a camera in front of us all right kenna thank you so much for stopping by next week we might hear from kubo's dole another reporter <laughs> so we will see how that goes all right james special thank you to you congratulations on your big win jenna dubos i'll see you soon all right until next week bye punchy is a production of rival we are a growth consultancy that builds challenger brands strategies and capabilities to disrupt categories if you want to learn more about us, check out wearerival.com. If you want to connect with Jenna, DuBose, or myself, email us at media at wearerival.com or find us on LinkedIn. If you enjoyed today's show, please subscribe, share with anyone you think might enjoy it, and leave us a review. Thanks so much for listening and see you next week.